dude, we're here at the end of uh, two months of you coming over here from the States. Um, it feels a little bit odd to be now we're doing this because we've been talking like throughout the tour. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've, I've put some questions together. Um, they're not, they don't really feel that linear. So for people watching at home, bear with me. Um, I'm not linear either. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, so some of this is stuff we've talked about while we've been hanging out and traveling around together. And mm -hmm. some of it I did literally last night. Um, so welcome to Play Dead Studio in South Sea. Um, uh, I kind of wanted to, first of all, maybe start off around um, hearing how kind of Radical Dharma, the book, uh -huh. kind of emerged. I heard you talk mm -hmm. about it in Brighton mm -hmm. a few times. Mm -hmm. And I'm, yeah, I was wondering if you could tell us how Radical Dharma, mm -hmm. the book, kind of was born really between, I think you and Angel were talking yeah. about it mm -hmm. and the circumstances around that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so we, Reverend Angel and myself, met each other, um, I think around the summer of 2013. And it was really nice, you know, to have that friendship. Um, and about a year passed from my first meeting where we didn't really interact or do anything. And then she called me up and um, asked me to be a part of a project um, that she was working on, mm -hmm. you know, putting together. So we reconnected through there, through that project. And um, I was in the process of moving back to Boston to start Divinity School. Um, and as I was just getting back to Boston, she happened to be passing through. So we ended up um, spending an evening together. And it was actually during that evening where we just had this time for the first time mm -hmm. in our relationship, where we just had time just sitting together and talking. And um, I was actually experiencing a lot of like upset, a lot of um, triggering around um, the emergence of Black Lives Matter, um, it was the summer, summer of Ferguson, you know, and Michael Brown being shot and killed. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was really feeling that and trying to figure out what my role in this emerging movement was. And mm -hmm. so these are the things we talked about. Um, and then after she left, you know, a friend of mine from Buddha Dharma emailed me asking me to do, you know, uh, a dialogue. Um, just like this one, you know, just to have a dialogue that was filmed. Um, and so we <coughs> filmed it. We put it on social media, we transcribed it, put it in the magazine, and people like loved it, mm -hmm. you know, people really loved it. And we came back together and just asked, you know, maybe we, you know, maybe there's something here for us to explore more. And so the idea of having live dialogues between Reverend Angel and myself emerged. Mm -hmm. um, we invited um, Yasmin to come and help us to organize the tour. Um, and the tour was four cities, five dialogues. Mm -hmm. um, we invited people from the community, from sanghas, from activist communities to come and share in the dialogue. At the end of these dialogues, um, we collected the footage, we transcribed it, and from that transcription, we developed the book Radical Dharma. Right, okay. And was that kind of informed a little bit by the Cornell West book around the kind of dialogue yeah. structure of the book? Yeah, yeah, Breaking Bread was something um, that Reverend Angel in particular was super moved by. Uh -huh. And I had been moved by it too, having read it um, several years ago. Um, to have a dialogue between two black drama teachers was something that no one had ever seen. Mm -hmm. Particularly radical queer um, drama teachers. And this is 2015? This 20, is 20, 2014, 2015. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't particularly get how important it was because I always had dialogues mm -hmm. with other black radical queer folks, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, but I underestimated the impact that it would have for sure in the community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how did, um, so you had those dialogues transcribed. Mm -hmm. How did you decide like what would fill up the rest of the book? What would kind yeah. of go in between that? And it was like chapters around like queer dialogue yeah. and other things that you put in there. Everything was so organic. Mm -hmm. You know, we would have all kinds of calls together between the three of us, and we would just, again, the book emerged from conversations, so we weren't, weren't planning anything, but we would just get together, or we would get to, 
together on our call mm-hmm. and just talk about our lives, talk mm-hmm. about what's happening because we're friends. Yeah. And then from these conversations, we would be like, oh, this would be interesting to write about, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, um, this would be interesting to explore. I remember the afternoon that we came up with the idea of home leaving, which became a section mm-hmm. in the book where mm-hmm. we were just like, oh, you know, we've all had to leave where we were born. Mm-hmm. in order to figure out who we were and that's a lot like the Buddha mm-hmm. you know so that became a chapter mm-hmm. and then further on we were like okay what do we care about you know and I was really into love I wanted to talk about love you know um, and I was and then we were like okay you talk about love you know and then we just kind of figured out the values or the things that we were really interested in the topics mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and that became our main essays in the book mm-hmm. and in the last set of essays um, it was just like what do we want to say as this book ends like what's our final words you know and of course radical presence became my final words mm-hmm. for that book the, the last part of the book is what I kind of um, resonate with me the most yeah. I think um, yeah. I'm a very slow reader yeah. being dyslexic and I've got to read things t- two or three times mm-hmm. but that that part of the book I almost didn't have to reread it do you know what I mean? It kind yeah. Of, yeah, it was really, it was lovely, yeah. and and I and I like the conversational tone throughout the book. Mm-hmm. That mm-hmm. made it a lot easier yeah. for me to. Um, I didn't feel like I was having to read a book and remember it. Yeah, because it was like it was, a, it was like a conversation, mm-hmm. almost with me and whoever was writing. Yeah. You know, so I kind of and I haven't read Breaking Bread, but right. um, I kind of want to now. Yeah, if it's the similar kind of format and kind yeah. of tone and approach yeah. to it. Yeah. And that's why I told Cornell when I, you know, met him because he's a pr- professor yeah. of my graduate program, you know, and I was like, you know, we were inspired by this. I mean, I cite Cornell West in the book mm-hmm. and it was particularly moved um, by a talk that he gave um, as we were writing or right before we started writing the book on prophetic wisdom, the, the black prophetic tradition. And I was like, wow, this is what we're doing, mm-hmm. you know, and then Angel and I really started um, to embrace that idea that this is like our expression of the black prophetic wisdom tradition. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know? and I think the book is very much occupied in this kind of tradition, which is rooted in the black community, about how do we actually begin to articulate the truth mm-hmm, of mm-hmm. our experience in a way that we don't censor it. Mm-hmm. You know? This is the truth. This is the truth as we live it. Mm-hmm. You know? Take it or leave it. And for everyone, this is, Google it, mm. go and get a copy. Um, okay, cool. Uh, I, so I wanted to also talk about, so move on to like your, your trip here. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. uh, it's been lovely. Oh, great. I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm upset that the Queen hasn't made arrangements to meet up with me. Do you know I sent an email? She sent an email She's to the really Queen. She's To the Queen doing what? Being um, rich? Yeah. Uh, having tea? I, 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 Getting I, rid of all the immigrants? <laughs> <laughs> um, <Eating> swans. <laughs> so uh, okay, don't distract me. I watched the trying to be professional. I know what she does. <laughs> Her whole life is exposed now on Netflix. You did see the Queen's Hotel <laughs> when you were here. I've seen Buckingham Palace as well. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of room. I think they should do Airbnb. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. I'm gonna go back to what I'm doing. So uh, I, I'm interested. Uh, I'm going to talk about the UK, but mm-hmm. in terms of like coming over to Europe. Yeah. Um, what have you noticed from visiting? I mean, you probably noticed a lot, but if you could kind of find two or three key things that you've noticed yeah. around visiting Dharma communities yeah. in Europe yeah. compared to the States, because yeah. you, you know you travel a lot yeah. and teaching at different communities. Yeah. You know, one thing that I noticed, and actually, this is something that people are actually you know telling me, but I was actually able to see it mm-hmm. as well, is that you know there's not a lot of diversity in teaching. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, okay, this is the way one teaches. And of course, I'm in a particular community. I'm in the insight community here, you know, and going through, you know, these communities that have been trained um, in that tradition. But, you know, just seeing that and seeing how easy it is to teach outside of the box with actually no effort. Right. You know, um, I see that in America as well. But people in America, teachers in America are much more likely to step out of the box. Mm -hmm. Um, because there's, we have a bigger country, there's so many different people, you know, so you can get an audience, you know, for new things. Mm-hmm. So I've noticed that. Um, I've noticed 
also, you know, there's not a lot of bringing in like social justice teachings in the Dharma. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's almost as if it's off, off limits. Mm -hmm. But I think even further, I think it's just they're teachers who have very little experience in that world. Mm -hmm. So how can you teach about something mm -hmm. you don't have experience in? Mm -hmm. yeah. And what was your what did you notice as the response when you when you did step outside that box to, to those within those communities? People mm -hmm. loved it. Uh -huh. I mean, I of course some people didn't, mm -hmm. but people know better than to like tell me that um, in person. They'll write it, yeah. in which and then I'll throw it away. Um, <laughs> but like people were just like, thank you, because these are the things I think about all the time, but no one talks about it. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, which is exactly what I do in the States in America. Like, this is the exact same mm -hmm. feedback, but I'm also teaching with colleagues and we're all doing this very similar work, mm -hmm. you know, so I'm not the only person doing this, mm -hmm. you know, bringing these issues into Dharma. Um, I was very surprised, particularly to get to Finland, to Helsinki and for someone to, to have someone there who had been following me even before Radical Dharma. Right who was like, oh, I knew who you were even before this book came out. And that was really interesting to, to see that, that there was someone in Helsinki, Finland, who knew me, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so that was great, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but yeah, I think communities are really ready mm -hmm. for this. And, and kind of maybe leaning on to, leaning on to Guy House. Yeah. So we got you um, a retreat, a three-day retreat at yeah. Guy House. Um, and the experience of dozens of people there were around how pleased they were to be sitting with you, yeah. but also then in many, many people's experiences there mm -hmm. um, of around almost a decade of practice yeah. with many people <coughs> going to Gaia House and going on retreats there, mm -hmm. that they'd never seen or sat with so many queer or people of color yeah. on a retreat at Gaia House. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. What was your, what was your experience as a teacher mm -hmm. with, that, with that happening and hearing that being shared? Yeah. Yeah, it was fascinating, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I think there were more queer people than people of color. Mm -hmm. And then of course, there was this intersection of queer people of color as well. Mm -hmm. um, but when I heard that, I was like, wow, like this is like new for you, <laughs> you know? I mean, I walk into a room and count all the people of color, you know? It's not even something conscious. I just automatically register, oh, seven people of color here, you yeah. know? Um, like about 50? About over 50. Right, 50, yeah. 55, almost 60. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, you know, it just points to the fact that how segregated these spaces are, but also points to the fact that how uninterested these spaces are in inclusion. Mm -hmm. So you can say inclusion, but that's very different than being interested in inclusion mm -hmm. and doing something about that. Mm -hmm. It's, it's very fashionable to talk about inclusivity. Mm -hmm. and, and over here, the word diversity is used a lot as well. Yeah, which you yeah. shouldn't do. Mm -hmm. You know, you might as well use homosexual to talk about queer people. <laughs> <laughs> um, so diversity is, is, is 90, it's like, that's like the 90s, you know, that's like, that's what we were doing and cultural like sensitivity, that's like 90s, you know, mm -hmm. you have to kind of step it up a little bit. So what, what, would, you, what, what would you suggest they step it up to then? Well, you know, you have to start inviting more teachers like me. Because mm -hmm. apparently, if all these people showed up for me, then apparently people want. Of course, probably half the people didn't know what they were getting into. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I think more than half. <laughs> probably yeah. more than half. But I think that half ended up appreciating mm -hmm. what they stepped into unknowingly. Mm -hmm. You know, that's how you have to get people sometimes. You have to trick them. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to be like, no, I'm just like this really nice black guy. Like, I'm your black friend. <laughs> you know, I'm the black friend who doesn't challenge you, who mm -hmm. smiles and nods when you say really fucked up stuff, you know. Um, so come and sit with me and I'll just smile and nod at your bullshit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then you break that and you're like, well, really? Mm -hmm. You know, I think you're kind of fucked up. Let's talk about it mm -hmm. and let's meditate around it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, that's unpleasant. So on that, mm -hmm. on that exact point, how do predominantly white spaces then, in particular, mm -hmm. white sanghas yeah. and institutions like Guy House, yeah. um, and like Yasmin says in the book, how, how do they actually navigate the reality of race 
specifically in the room. Not when it's in the room, because it's always there, but yeah. when it, in the room, yeah. in, that, in that moment. Yeah, I think you just have to start centering discomfort. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to be like, oh, this is really uncomfortable. You know, there are different people in the room. It's okay to see difference. You uh -huh. know, it's okay, it's okay to say, oh, there's a black person, you know? <laughs> I mean, that's okay to acknowledge that instead of avoiding it, mm -hmm. you know, because if we just acknowledge who's in the room, then people become visible. And that's a really important first step towards inclusivity. When we become visible in the space and people see us and they're not avoiding us, they're not trying to bypass us. Mm -hmm. That's really important. And then you begin to understand how you are centering your comfort in the space. Mm -hmm. It's unusual though, isn't it? Because the Dharma community are almost committed to discomfort. Yeah. Yet, when, well, you know, that's the assumption, isn't it? We, you know, committed mm -hmm. to being uncomfortable. Well, no, it's, yeah, in a way. Yeah. You know, yeah, the first noble truth is about discomfort. But as Reverend Angel says in the book, people are really much more into a kinder, general yeah. kind of suffering, mm -hmm. which means that I want to pick a suffering that's more comfortable for me. Mm -hmm. You know? So that's a manipulation of that teaching. When we say discomfort, we have to actually hold the space for the whole thing, for all the discomfort, mm -hmm. instead of bypassing the really, really tough stuff. You begin to center the really, really tough stuff. That's where the transformation begins to happen. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like, um, I don't know if you've heard this phrase, like uh, the, bi the, the bypass nut. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> that, that seems to be like a, a, a practice over here within the insight community. Well, Insight is synonymous with whiteness. Mm -hmm. You know, when you say insight, I hear, oh, white. <laughs> <laughs> you know, white Buddhism. You know, it's a kind of mm -hmm. sterile, you know, flavorless kind of, of, of practice. Van that vanilla? Is not, vanilla, not vanilla is flavor. Okay, all right, fair play. <laughs> vanilla is quite exciting. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, the flavorless, you know. And we translate Theravada into like this kind of streamlined, sterile practice, and really is it. It's quite dynamic. Mm -hmm. But that dy dynamic nature is manipulated because Theravada pinpoints the suffering. It pinpoints where we're stuck. And you can go around that quite a bit, and people do. Yeah. Um, quite a bit. And so people, communities love to invite me into their insight communities because I can transmit the essence of some of these teachings in a way in which I don't bypass and people get that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like people get that I'm not sitting there yelling at people or making people feel bad I'm just expressing Dharma you know and I don't let people bypass identity mm -hmm. into no self mm -hmm. you know because it's so easy mm -hmm. you know bring the Dharma into the relative into the workings of identity and ego and let's explore that because that's where we're stuck mm -hmm. you know we we get we slip right off of ego into no self mm -hmm. and that's where people feel really good so like experience the ultimate through the relative yeah where we're stuck where we seem to have a blockage yeah. Yeah. which is what radical dharma is about is about we can't experience ultimate liberation without social liberation mm -hmm. we can, are in the more dharmic language it's like you'll never get to the ultimate without going to the relative. Mm -hmm. I'm going to skip to the uh, one of my questions yeah. that is at the end because we're kind of there already. Yeah. So um, on that then, on the ult ultimate relative, what I asked you this before when we, I think we were traveling to like, when we come back from London or something um, around <clears throat> enlightenment in inverted commas that kind of yeah. waking up. One would think that would include um, the falling away of misogyny, patriarchy, mm -hmm. racism. Mm -hmm. But it seems <clears throat> mm -hmm. that um, they are people who claim to or um, behave in a way of being awake, yeah. where they need to actually be doing additional modules yeah. of sexism, exactly. racism. Why, why, yeah. uh, so why, why do you think that is? Yeah. I have my theory. Mm -hmm. I yeah. that, but, but also, does waking up through the Dharma, it actually does include those things, but it's just for mm -hmm. some reason not happening. There are different kinds of waking up. I think the ego is quite complex. I think we can wake to aspects of ego, mm -hmm. but we need other skillful strategies to bring attention to the parts of the ego, which are easy to right. bypass. Right. You know, um, you know, if we look at some of the work that people are doing around 
psychotherapy and dharma, mm -hmm. we're beginning to get into to some theories around how enlightenment casts shadows. Right. You know? Yeah. Um, and I love this work that um, people are doing around how the Buddha had a shadow mm -hmm. and how people articulated the shadow as characters within his narrative. You know, I really appreciate that because that actually helps us to understand that like enlightenment isn't perfect. You know, that there are ways in which um, we have to still rely on others to point out um, what we're missing. Mm -hmm. You know, so you talk about being trained as a, a Dharma teacher, and I think this is any tradition. Um, you don't get like a training on like sexism and ageism or any of that. It's just you just you learn how to practice Dharma. You learn how to think about Dharma. That was the case in my training. It was profound and great and beautiful and intense and transformative. Um, but you're not taught how to be a teacher. Mm -hmm. You're taught how to practice and talk about drama. Mm -hmm. That's very different than being a teacher. Teacher to me means that you're also a counselor, you're a chaplain, you're a mediator. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. um, you're having to have some grounding in a lot of the issues that people are bringing into the sangha. Mm -hmm. You know, particularly sexual assault and mm -hmm. and trauma. Those are issues that we completely fail on mm -hmm. in in our sangha. I'm really pleased you said that actually because. Um, I find my psychotherapy training really supports yeah. the work I do here at Samsi mm -hmm. Sangha, mm -hmm. um, but uh, I never kind of acknowledged that to myself really, mm -hmm. I kind of <clears throat> knew it was there, but uh, mm -hmm. I'm kind of noticing, I don't know, an intersection there around how mm -hmm. those really support each other. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I think of myself as a minister. Mm -hmm. I'm formally trained as a minister, you know, my credentials, because I have a Master of Divinity. You know, I intentionally did that work and got that degree because I felt like Dharma teachers need to be more than Dharma teachers. We need to be ministers, Buddhist sure. ministers. We yeah. need to follow the model um, of other classes of clergy and other traditions. Mm -hmm. You know, that makes our training more holistic. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that we will begin to see an alleviation of some of the, these core issues that we're struggling with. Mm -hmm. You know, um, but our communities are not doing well around these issues. Mm -hmm. You know, there's such intense strands of victim blaming, you know, misogyny, um, ageism, you know, ableism. Mm -hmm. Like all this stuff is so rampant, mm -hmm. you know, but it's swept under the rug, it's mm -hmm. ignored, it's erased. So, um, Segwaying on to the next question, so this is all going to shit in terms of linear mapping with the with, with my questions, but we're gonna we're gonna go with it. This is queerness. <laughs> this is queerness. You have to disrupt. How, okay, you're disrupting me. <laughs> okay. How does how does your politics around gender, sexuality, and queerness inform your dharma practice then, and vice versa? Is there feedback between the two? Yeah, I don't see dharma as being hegemonic. In the same way, I don't see gender, sexuality, queerness in general as being hegemonic. Mm -hmm. So I see everything as being quite fluid. So when I step into a space as a teacher, um, Dharma teacher or Buddhist minister, and then I am beginning to play with things. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm beginning to play with everything that I can play with, language you know, with positionalities, with ideas, you know, I begin to play with people, mm -hmm. you know, because my role is to disrupt you, you know, mm -hmm. is to get you unsettled because in being unsettled, we begin to earn our dharma. Mm -hmm. We begin to actually practice. Mm -hmm. If we're always comfortable, nothing's going to happen. It's kind of like in the book, uh, I think it was Reverend Angel talked about, so this, this disruption you're talking yeah. about, it, it reminds me of something shared around interrogation. interrogation. Dharma practice is, is around interrogation yeah. and by interrogating your experience, you realize what you're not interrogating yeah. and, and actually yeah. what you're missing. Yeah. But you need to, you need that to do that disturbance, yeah. that disruption needs to happen first. Yeah. And I just, <clears> I mean, I don't, I can just walk into a room and disturb it, you know, because I'm black and queer and I'm, super underrepresented in the world of Dharma. 
you know, so just by walking into a space, I automatically disrupt it. Mm-hmm. You know, and then I go further, and I actually push through that disruption. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, t- and I intensify it mm-hmm. as well. You know, that's what queerness is for me. That's what we talk about in the book. Queerness is just like, okay, I, I think inherently we should be disrupting all the time. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. I think there should always be fluidity. And I think there should always be openness, transparency, um, radical welcoming. And that's why I understand queerness to be. That's how I teach. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's through that lens. Mm, because radical honesty. And, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. You know? And that there are, whole, there are lots of different people in the room. And so I have my experiences of Dharma. But you may have different experiences of Dharma. How do I create the space for everyone to have their experience? Mm-hmm. You know, and not to say, well, this is the only experience you should be having. You know, which is a number one thing that I get upset with with teachers is like like don't make it so rigid. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we mm-hmm. talked about that rigidity yesterday yeah. at the retreat. Didn't we? Yeah. yeah, yeah, and it's so it's so subtle. Mm-hmm. It, you'd think something rigid would be quite obvious and explicit, mm-hmm. but actually, it's a very subtle movement mm-hmm. becoming rigid. It, I, on my experience, mm-hmm. almost like you, you that, that movement towards rigidity, you don't see it happening. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And when you walk into the Dharma space, you walk into like the retreat that we had yesterday or any retreat. Mm-hmm. And it's like, it's so people, there's like this etiquette and people fall into it. That's the epitome of rigid, mm-hmm. you know? And we say, oh, but you have to be like this. But who said that? Mm-hmm. You know? So there are traditions of Buddhism that um, are really interested in doing very different things mm-hmm. besides just sitting together in silence. Mm-hmm. you know um, so I love exploring that mm. Mm. yeah I mean I joke about Beyonce and getting into formation but people when you say let's meditate there's a formation that happens mm-hmm. people there's a fall. shift isn't there there's a shift and, I'm, and sometimes I'll be like stop <laughs> like what did I just say I just said let's meditate and now you've assumed mm-hmm. all these things that you're going to start doing you know like just disrupt that like mm-hmm. what are you doing why are you programmed to do what you're doing you know, what do you need to do right now? Mm-hmm. You, know, you give people back their agency, and that's what Dharma teachers do not do. Mm-hmm. Because that undermines our authority. Sure. And I'm interested in undermining my authority. <laughs> you know, well, it backfires sometimes. Well, on that, I'm going to undermine you now and go straight back to race in Britain. <laughs> because uh, um, kind of, we were talking around uh, the British experience. Yeah. Of your of your trip, the British. <laughs> That's good. That's good. <laughs> why, why do you think that we that we're, when race race and ethnicity are talked about, not exclusively, yeah. but more often with well-meaning white people, yeah. that they still say they don't see color, that they see everyone as a person, they see past the color. Yeah. Well, because it feels good. Mm-hmm. Because it alleviates you from taking responsibility for the ways in which you are really informed by difference in race to relate to people you know so we want to get into this place of comfort and there are teachings around yourself so let's go there Mm -hmm. you know let's try to fake it but you're actually not faking it Mm -hmm. you know you're just bypassing it right and that's why it's unhelpful to undoing any kind of oppression or equality around race Mm -hmm. and well anything really Mm -hmm. when you kind of say oh just see past that we want to do what's easy um, we want to do what's easy and safe and what feels good and what's comfortable. Mm-hmm. That's not how I understand Dharma. That's how I understand the maintenance of positions of power and hierarchy. Mm-hmm. So we've conflated Dharma with maintaining power and hierarchy and social position. Right. You know? And so we have to, again, recenter discomfort. Mm-hmm. You know, and this this idea that these communities aren't for me to to continue to support these really violent ways of being in the world. Which is around the relationship to race. Yeah. You talked about in the book. I mean, I mean you think race isn't necessarily the problem, it's the relationship we have to it. Mm-hmm. Exactly. It's not it's never in Buddhism Buddhism is never the thing itself. Mm-hmm. It's not the phenomena, it's our relationship to the phenomena. Do we believe in it? 
do we take it for being real? How do we react to it? How do we create narratives around that phenomenon? Mm -hmm. How do we use it to exploit others? You know, that's the issue. Mm -hmm. You know, blackness isn't the issue. Whiteness isn't the issue. Is how we've created meaning and defined it mm -hmm. at the expense of others. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. So, um, kind of related to that, that there's a, there's a there's a set, there's a line from James Baldwin. Right. I know you're a huge James Baldwin fan. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't read as much as you, but I, I find him so fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a line that he had in his speech in Berkeley that I don't didn't fully understand. Mm -hmm. Um, I wonder what your interpretation of it mm -hmm. was when he said, insofar as you think you're white, you're irrelevant. We can no longer afford that particular romance. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that touching upon what you just said or is it something, am I, am I missing that? What is the way in which we use identity to center ourselves? Mm -hmm. You know, so whiteness is always centered, is always dominant. And so that's uh, a narrative that we can't afford anymore. Right. You know, because that centering of that narrative comes at the expense of the whole world. You know, so many of our issues come from the centering of whiteness, the centering of dominance. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and the intersection of capitalism within that mm -hmm. as well. You know, so we can't. So when Baldwin says we can't afford that, it's like we can't afford it. The planet can't afford it any longer. You know. And you have to disrupt that to get into the sadness, the mourning, the grief, mm -hmm. and everything that maintaining an identity of power has cost. Not just everyone around you, but you. Mm. You know, To reclaim our humanity means that we have to go through these folds of identity that we've created to distance ourselves from the, our woundedness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. The, the other British trait that I wanted to see if you've encountered mm -hmm. um, and something I've experienced with whenever I've had, tr had this conversation with mm -hmm. um, either colleagues or students, mm -hmm. um, not to teach, but just actually hear, get the conversation started so I can learn as well mm -hmm. around race, mm -hmm. in particular with white people in Britain, the conversation inevitably either just becomes about class mm -hmm. or becomes dominated by class. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering if you've, if you've noticed that. Oh, yeah. Um, and what your, your thoughts around that, mm -hmm. why you think that, that yeah. movement happens. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've had a conversation about race here and, it's, and it quickly transitioned into class. Mm -hmm. And what I saw was this deep, deep woundedness mm -hmm. around class, you know, in this country. And I get that, you know, but also it keeps us from actually understanding the interconnection between race and class, mm -hmm. you know. So in America, yeah, we don't talk about class so much, but we talk about race because class comes from race mm -hmm. in the American context. That's right. how class was created. Mm -hmm. You know, it was in opposition to blackness, mm -hmm. you know. But here is, yeah, there was class before there was race, but race became an issue, mm -hmm. you know, and there hasn't been enough work that has a bit enough effort to acknowledge that to bring those issues into light because you, you see i mean you your trip here happened to coincide with the stephen lawrence mm -hmm. anniversary yeah. and the wind rush scandal that's mm -hmm. unfolding like now yeah. and in the mainstream media and i've been following it to the extent that you know um it's just there's a lot it's, it's actually quite painful to listen yeah. to but from everything that i've been watching and reading i think i've seen one or two mm -hmm. ministers mm -hmm. or commentators uh, actually call the immigration policy as racist yeah. but generally the narrative is around how this is how the government treats the working class mm -hmm. um, and the issue of race is kind of vanished again yeah I think you know in America when we talk about working class what people mean are white people right you know and maybe the same thing is happening here you know it's like the working class is being impacted well you know do you consider black people are the Rinrush generation part of that class, you know, or it's just, just a way that you're continuing to erase, mm. you know, uh, the population of black people who came to this country because of this policy, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and this whole thing around um, Theresa May's whole like policy around was an 
creating an environment of like hostility hostility that's the epitome of racism you know that's what racism really is you know and cheers for her for like just pointing it out you know <laughs> i think it takes i wish we would do that in america like mm -hmm. you just want to create an environment of hostility can we just say that you know um i think that's just really violent you know because who's this hostility towards mm -hmm. you know it's towards brown people and immigrants mm -hmm. you know that's very racist most immigrants are brown you know um it's cruel it's mean it's racist it's, it's also classist mm -hmm. yeah um, but what is what's being what, what's fueling that though? You know, it's always my question. Where is this coming from? Mm. You know, mm. is it coming from this fear of whiteness being disrupted, being decentered? Mm -hmm. You know, it's this kind of terror. You know that white people will be the minority, which there are white people are the minority now in the world. So is that coming from that terror, mm -hmm. that anxiety? Like we want to save ourselves mm -hmm. from what? Well, they sort of like they have an anxiety that somewhere somehow um, they treat minority people with oppression and cruelty. I don't know where they get that from. That's maybe where <laughs> oh, we're mm -hmm. becoming the minority. Hang on a minute. Mm -hmm. um, we treat minorities a certain way. We do not want that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's that glimpse into how we relate to other people, mm -hmm. and now we're changing positions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Last two questions. Okay. Um, so this kind of, I guess, involves me a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so I can't remember if it, I think it's in your book. Mm -hmm. You said it at some point, trust mm -hmm. me, you said this. But, <laughs> but you said something around, um, you noticed uh, when you, I think it was in the book, when you're on tour, uh -huh. uh, doing the dialogues, uh -huh. that you, you attract, um, you noticed you yeah. attracted uh, white mm -hmm. males yeah. into either wanting to, to work with you or mm -hmm. listen to you or sit with you. And you're mm -hmm. like, oh, that's the thing. Mm -hmm. I've just noticed that, mm -hmm. and then um, and then I pop up, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I'm white mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm a man, and um, and I was you know reaching out to you and we organised this tour and yeah. and I'm so grateful for you trusting me to kind of bring you over and mm -hmm. and send you on the road and stuff. But why do you think that is? Yeah. Um, I was unaware of me doing it, but you said it was a pattern you noticed. Yeah. I'm just yeah. wondering why you noticed. What, yeah. I think there's all kinds of dynamics, you know. Mm -hmm. um, one dynamic maybe is how I present masculinity, you know, and how easy it is for, for other men to connect to me who right. are interested in alternative masculinities. I think that's it. I think there is something within the historical relationship between black men and white men. You know, I think there's something um, that I offer to white men in terms of healing, you know, and reconciliation um, in terms of that historical relationship mm -hmm. um, particularly in America there's been such intense violence between white men um, and and black men I mean there's just basically violence from white men in America period <laughs> you know um, but particularly you know in the relationship with white with with black men um, I think there's a particular kind of historical violence that I have done a lot of work to reconcile, to work through, to heal, mm -hmm. to purify, and whatever, you know. So I think that that people, that men, white men, actually feel that, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I'm able to allow particularly white men to grieve, you know, and that's important. That's not. I don't. That's that. Yeah, of course, that's emotional labor for me. But that's you're still doing the work of your own grieving. And I, you know, I think that's important for me to hold space for that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also, I think it's also sexuality as well. And I think like unconsciously, like, you know, um, men are attracted to me, you know, and that's fine. Um, in the same ways that like some of the teachers that I have, I have because initially I was like attracted to them. You know, mm -hmm. I think we all need a hook. You know, and I've had this conversation with people where it's like, <clears throat> you know, people have told me, particularly white men have told me, oh, I'm with you because you're black. You know, I think that's really interesting, mm -hmm. you know, to look at. I'm not particularly offended, 
you know, because I think that karmic connections with teachers happen in all kinds of ways. Mm. Mm. You know? Yeah. And so I'm willing to open to that, to explore that. Mm -hmm. As long as you're willing to practice, mm -hmm. and to do the work, it's fine. Mm -hmm. That's how you led to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think you're hot, by the way. I think I am hot, too, as well. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so uh, something around... We've had this conversation around as well, as well around it, allowing men to do emotional mm -hmm. labor that they didn't even know they needed to do. Yeah. Um, and men who have years of Dharma practice too, mm -hmm. around mm -hmm. patriarchy, around their role in it, mm -hmm. um, their complicitness around that, and that's that's painful stuff to do. Yes. Mm. Mm -hmm. And you do a lot of that work in the states, right? Yep. Yep. Around undoing patriarchy. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's work that I feel is my work to do. You know, we talk about this emerging movement of Me Too and Time's Up. I think, you know, it's up to men to start organizing spaces for us to start unpacking our own emotional violence mm. and not expecting women or gender expansive or gender creative communities to do that work for us because we're a burden. Mm -hmm. You know, not only are people having to work through the trauma around oppression, sexual assault, sexual misconduct, they're also having to hold our own guilt, mm -hmm. you know, and our own despair, which is heavy. Mm -hmm. So I feel as if I need to create spaces for men to do that work mm -hmm. so they can actually begin to disrupt the heart of, of patriarchy and misogyny, which is self-hate. Um, which is a denial of our own emotional reality, which is the belief of dominance, and which is the fear of our own bodies and sexuality. Mm -hmm. It's the fear of weakness. And it's one, well wanted. Men, uh, I've, I've talked about it at Sangha around how I'm going to be working with you around those things, mm -hmm. and, and men mm -hmm. want that space mm -hmm. to do that labor. Mm -hmm. um, and hopefully, you know, I know our Sangha are going to work to provide that, but I think more and more communities are in a really good position to provide their space yeah. mm -hmm. to, their, to members of their community mm -hmm. to do that emotional labor because mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. it's difficult but we have the tools to do that that's yeah. like that's the beauty of it right yeah yeah, yeah. that you know of course I get a lot of feedback um, from the radical community and some people are like no you don't we don't need all male spaces I, I disagree with that you know because I, th I have seen men who will only do this processing work if they're with people who completely identify with them, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so I believe in the work that affinity groups can do, you know, and I'm an advocate for that because I think there are certain things that can only be done within affinity groups, within groups where people share the same identity locations. Mm -hmm. As opposed to people saying, well, we, we're separate enough. Why do we need to separate more? Exactly. Yeah. You know, um, but we need, like, we have to create safe spaces. Only in safe spaces can we do this really intense emotional work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? Absolutely, yeah. And then, my, of course, my whole thing is that, like, I do this affinity group work only to learn how to reintegrate back into larger communities. Mm -hmm. You know, kind of like radical self care, yeah. you know, indulgence. We're doing the work so we can return. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Mm. 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 Okay, last one. Mm -hmm. I was hoping we'd get a bit of a South Sea Sang uh, exclusive here. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, around your, new, your your next book, mm -hmm. um, you've kind of been talking about you know, tinkering with this idea and, and stuff. So, um, what is it? I, I I know, but I want other people to know. Um, <laughs> What is it yeah. around, um, and, and is it kind of, did it emerge whilst you were kind of formulating Radical Dharma? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Is it something that you felt was missing from the book? Um, uh, or was it complex or something else? And when will it be out and when, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, yeah, you know, my first book after Radical Dharma was gonna be a book on patriarchy. Mm -hmm. I'm doing patriarchy, but I'm actually not ready for that. <laughs> to write that book even though I wrote a lot of it I'm not ready to like actually finish it so I put it to the side and just was really trying to you know just doing all this work in communities and starting to notice the themes that kept coming up that people were just really stuck around and that was rage 
it was anger and rage and I began to think okay maybe this is where I need to go mm -hmm. you know and then of course love comes up as a really important thing you know but what I also noticed was despair and heartbreak mm -hmm. you know and what I'm always interested in is the liberation piece you know so this next book is actually a dialogue between love and rage and how that dialogue leads us into the reality of heartbrokenness that many of us are carrying around. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you don't want to stay at the level of having a broken heart. So you want to move into liberatory strategies. Mm -hmm. you know? So this is what the book is about, this examination of these issues. But it's going to be an, a practice book. Right. You know, so it's not just me talking about love and stuff like we did in Radical Dharma. It's actually, no, these are the practices that you can mm. actually use. And it's, it's going to be quite radical. Mm -hmm. It's going to have pictures. I don't know if it's going to have pictures. <laughs> I don't know yet. Maybe, but <laughs> I think it's going to like embrace several traditions at once. Cool. You know, and it's not just going to be a mindfulness in this book. It's not going to be just a tantric book. It's not just going to be like or whatever book is actually going to say, okay, we need a variety of tools to work through this, you mm -hmm. know? Um, and I'm writing it from the perspective of my body, wow. you know? And so I think it's going to be a very, very different Dharma book mm -hmm. for people that I hope will actually transcend communities mm -hmm. in, a, in the same way Radical Dharma well, is Yeah, that's what Radical Dharma's done. I think you know? it's really done really well. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm excited to see where that goes. Yeah. Mm, thank you. Mm -hmm. Cheers, dude. So it'll be out next June, June 2019. Sweet. Yeah. Cool. Um, so I wanted to say thank you to um, the people behind the cameras who you can't see. <laughs> um, and uh, Play Dead Studio. Um, that's where we are right now. It's an awesome gallery and tattoo studio. And this beautiful person come quick you just want to hug me don't you <laughs> <laughs> check them out online really lovely, really, really lovely. Um, <laughs> and uh, if you I guess uh, if you want to um, check us out Safsi Sangha we've got a website um, and Radical Dharma Rod's website and um, and Play Dead as well um, we're all kind of intertwined doing lots of things that are kind of uh, supportive and similar so check us out and do thank you for coming over thank here thank you and, uh, Let's yeah. get back to stay safe. Yep. Yeah.